Son, the Holy Spirit, one God. I mean, Christos Anesti. And Messiah Hukam. Christ is risen. It is a custom that we come tonight and we do this visitors whom I really have grew loving. Um, when I was a deacon, I was actually in medical school. I remember Abuna, God be with him, uh, Father Abuna uh, Sarabamon in, in St. Barbara. He's sick and he needs our prayers. He's a dear father and I, I served with him as a deacon. He used to tell me this. So I go there, even when I was in America working, I used to go back for the whole week. He say, you're going to stay with us the whole week? I was serving with him as a deacon. And he said, but remember, your holy week is not done until Shemin Nassim. You're not done until Monday morning. And from that, from that, I learned to love this Vespers. And it's a very interesting thing because he, he didn't have a ma'alim, or the ma'alim that was not really coming to church regularly. So I was it. I was in ma'alim and I was a deacon. You can see the, disas the disasters that were happening. I would sing and make mistakes and nobody's listening. So it was okay. Then I go home and I said, I'm, I, did I did a mistake with this, but I don't have time to learn it. Move on to the next one. <laughs> Move on and make up as I go on. I've learned all the Holy Week hymns by pushing. So I used to go home and not sleep and review the hymns for the next day. This is how I was, I pushed, was pushed to learn most of the, the church hymns, especially Holy Week, which is not easy. I'm going to tell you that. Uh, en enough to attend Thursday and you will know what I'm talking about. It's a nightmare. You have to do uh, the abraxis, and have to do Vaid of Inf, and you have to do uh, Agios, and then Bekathronus, and you have to learn all that in a night. Just, you know. But I, what I'm trying to say in the beginning, it was a disaster, then it keeps improving. Every year I will learn a little bit more and improve on it. But I've learned the importance of this whispers. This is what I'm trying to say. It is through the Holy Week that I understood the church. I will never forget that. It was in that church in St. Barbara I learned what the church is trying to do. Because I didn't understand the church. When you don't understand the church, it's boring. Let's face it. It's boring. I used to be bored out of my mind. I want to run out of the church. Especially when you attend the Holy Week and you're forced, there is nowhere to go. And you just have to listen to do, 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 all day. <laughs> I didn't understand a thing. But I went to the church at night one, one time after Holy, after Friday, uh, I was like, I want to run out of here. No, somebody saves me, please. We get out of the church, and I have this deacon whom I liked a lot. He's a decent man. God have him, give, give him grace. His name is Magdisat. He doesn't remember me anymore. I think he's uh, going through some sickness. But he uh, told me, why don't you come with me to St. Barbara? It was a Friday, good Friday. And I said, oh, sure, I'll go. I'll go anywhere, just something new experience, something new. He said, that, that will be new experience for you. So I went late, it was late night, with midnight actually, started at midnight. <coughs> I remember walking from, we were living in El Maniel, walking from El Maniel to Masr Adima uh, in the old Cairo, and then going down the stairs, they described me the way, to go have to go down maybe 15, 20 stairs underground. And then you walk in a narrow alley, on stone paved roads, very tiny, very tiny roads between the houses on both sides. It's like this, maybe a little bigger than this. And then the house is from this side, the house is from this side, and you're walking. And it, some feeling came over me, very strange feeling. I cannot describe it. Something very weird I've never felt before. I've attended the Holy Week, I've attended Good Friday, I know exactly where we are. We just finished burying Jesus and it's night time. And all of a sudden I'm feeling going through the old streets. It's, uh, it felt like, and then I'm trying to think, what is this? Why is this feeling coming to me? And then I realized it's actually where I'm walking, as if I'm walking in the streets of Jerusalem, going to, to the tomb. St. Barba is the last of the, the churches. If you go to the old Cairo, it's the last one at the very end. Behind St. Barbara is a cemetery. It's a very quiet place. 
And there, there is like, I remember till today, there's like uh, kerosene candles hanging from the walls and it looked very real. And then I come down. I've never been to that place before. You can imagine. Then there's more steps down to St. Barbara. And I enter through the door. It's a beautiful church. Till now, till today. I fell in love with that church. With all the churches in this area. Coming through the door, I was hit. The, the altar was open. And I knew exactly what was on the altar, the, in the sanctuary. It was the burial of Jesus. So this is really was the tomb of Christ to me. And then the deacon, my friend, Magdi, was standing there singing Psalm 151. And that psalm, I owe everything. Because as he was singing it, I understood. All of a sudden, I understood what was going on. It is the church putting me exactly in the right thing. There was someone, I thought about it this way, someone who, who was very close to the king. I thought about him as the uh, clown, or the entertainer of the king. And the king died, so what would the clown do? Sit aside and weep. And weep. So he's weeping. And the, start, the psalm starts like this. Starts the psalms, all the things in Bright Saturday starts with weeping. Sad melodies. And all of a sudden, that sad, sad melody as I was sitting, standing there, I couldn't go anywhere. I stood at the door watching and just saying, what's going on? And as he was singing, all of a sudden the song started to change into joy. And everything came crashing. I completely understood the church. In that one second. In that one second. So, now when I look at the gospel, and when I look at the church, I see something ma magnificent, something royal, something beautiful, something amazing. Genius. Genius. Really genius. So this is gospel today. This is actually I want to do first before I go and have two pieces for you. I'm sorry if I'm going to um, bore you. But just if you heard this before. Um, it says, <clears throat> it was the night after Jesus rose from the dead. So what happened during the day? That, like today, Sunday. What happened? He rose very early morning. You know, with the sunrise. I can imagine. The first rim of the light of the sun is coming above the horizon. And Jesus is coming up from the, the sleep. That's how the psalm described him to us. He's coming up. Then he's, the who's outside the tomb, the guards, he comes out of the tomb and disappears. Nobody sees him. And the door is still shut of the tomb. The, the big stone is still on. Be, be careful, this is what the church believes. Jesus rose before the stone was removed. But then the angel came, and an earthquake came, and then big thing happened. Jesus rose silently and left. And the angel came, and the whole thing stopped shaking. Big light, and, and just great, great glory. Scary stuff. And the stones start rolling, and the angel were pu pushing the stone, huge stone. And when the angel showed himself, the, the soldiers got very terrified. They fell back like dead. But at the same time, the women arrived. And they were thinking, how are we going to move the stone? And they arrived. And then they saw this, and they saw the angel. And the angel said, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. You especially, don't be afraid. I'm not trying to scare you. You're looking for Jesus. He's not here. Then we know that the, 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 the women met Jesus, whom they come to seek. They met him, and St. Mary especially um, went back. I'm sorry. So St. Mary went back to the disciples and told them, the, the tomb is empty. We couldn't find him. And the angel said that he's, he rose. So they came back, Peter, John, and St. Mary. We heard this in the gospel yesterday. They looked, and the tomb was really empty. And there is a cloth, a piece of cloth. And then we're going to talk about this in a little second. A piece of cloth looked like this. A little fainter than this. This is too, uh, there's a lot of contrast in it, just to, to be able to see it. That cloth was the burial cloth of Jesus and has another piece which is the the piece of cloth, the linen that covered the head. They had to put the head together. It's really if you look at the if you if you really were there at the crucifixion after the the, the day is finished, to bring Jesus' body from the cross, guess what what do you find? Listen to me. You will find that his body is in rigor mortis. What's rigor mortis Abuna? Rigidity. 
He died like this and stayed on the cross for hours like this, two hours. When you bring him from the cross, what would he look like? Like that. It's not going to go back. You have to force the hands to come back. And there's a lot of meaning to that, but I'm not going to go into it. And the, the feet were top, on top of each other. If you try to separate them, they're not going to separate. And his jaw dropped. So out of respect, because there's blood coming from everywhere, they got this piece of handkerchief and they tied it around his jaw and lifted it up. You see that dark area around his face? You see that dark lines on the side? That's where the handkerchief was. On the side of the cheeks like this coming down. These dark lines are where the head scarf was to keep his jaw out of respect. We do this with the dead, right? You close their eyes and you close your jaw. So for Jesus' eyes, they have this in the tradition, they put two coins. And for the jaw, they put the, the handkerchief up. And that handkerchief is still in Spain. It's actually in Oviedo, in Spain, in the mountains. They have it in a very precious box and they keep it. But it doesn't have any, any image. It's just the blood. Because what they did with it is as they brought it down, St. Joseph and Nicodemus, they put that cloth on him. They tucked their fingers around in the mouth, in the nose, around the brows and the cheek to get all the, the blood. And then they wrapped it around his face. That's what happened. Uh, so this piece of cloth in that color was laying on the tomb, on the stone, and the handkerchief would lay by itself. And then the two disciples saw this and they went and they said, St. John believed. But Mary Magdalene stood at the door, and she was crying, and Jesus appeared. And then the notice, you notice one thing, Jesus appeared too many times in that, that day. He appeared maybe two, three, four times. And none of them, he allowed them to hold him. And none of them, actually most of them, they couldn't realize him until the end of the meeting. And whenever they realize him, what happens? He vanishes. What is the point? And then St. Louis in his book, the, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, he said he's playing hide and seek. Catch me if you can, right? Catch me if you can. That's the phrase used. Jesus told the girls in the, in the story, catch me if you can, after they, they got the resurrection. So the disciples were playing with Jesus, catch me if you can. But then when he goes at night, and this is what we read today, in that even the same day, evening, the first day of the week, then the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled, you get a lot of words here that every word of them has a very significant meaning to the church. I'll give it away. So this night is Jesus transitioning from his life with them to the mystical life of the church. He's moving them from being physically with them to the life of the church that we live in today. So what he's going to do, first thing Jesus is planning not to do, is to give himself away outside the, the church. He was with them, with the two disciples of Emmaus, we're going to do this liturgy tomorrow. Although it happened this morning, but we cannot do it today. We cannot do two liturgies in the one day. So we're going to do it to, today, tomorrow, in the morning from 6 to 8, to remember the event that happened today. Jesus walked with the disciples of Emmaus for three hours and they didn't know who he was. Which means Jesus will never leave you everywhere you go. He promised that. But to really be able to see him and handle him and recognize him, you're going to have to do what? Go back in the church. Because these two disciples reached Emmaus or reached the, the town they were going to spent some time with Jesus, didn't know him. The second they realized who he was, what happened? Disappeared. And then they have to go back running to the upper room. And they're telling everybody in the upper room, we saw him, we saw him, he was with us, we walked with him for three hours, we didn't know who he was. But as they were telling everybody what happened, Jesus himself stood in the midst and said, to them, peace be with you. Where do you hear that? In Greek, we said, what's that in Greek? Peace be with you. Irini Pasi. Where do you hear it? The church. That's why the church used it a lot. As if Jesus is continuing with us 
And we are experiencing him in the church. And every time we come to church, we're going to have to hear, peace be with you. What else? That a symbol, that he wants everybody to be together. That's why he's not going to show himself to Pilate. He's not going to show himself to the high priest. He's not going to show himself to any human being outside the church. No more. When he was in the life, in physical life, Jesus was showing himself to everybody. The people rejected him, accepted him, believed in him, disbelieved in him, whatever. They crucified him. But after the resurrection, he's only going to expose himself to, give himself up to the disciples in the church. That's why our church is very rich. Because until this day, after that, they kept this tradition. Sunday is the day of the Lord. You call it Kiriyi Ke or Kriyaki. Means that the day of the Lord. Kiri, Aki, the, 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 the day that belongs to the Lord. Sunday, where Jesus comes in our midst and we take his body. Then he showed him his hands. And then this time he said, he said to Mary Magdalene in the morning, don't touch me. And then in this meeting, he says to them, touch me, feel me, it is me, I have it. Here's the, the wounds. And everybody's touching him. And everybody's coming, giving him hug and rejoicing and ex excited. Then he gives him one more thing. He said, peace to you. He said it three times in this chapter. Three times. The church keeps repeating this. Peace be to you. Irini Pasi. Irini Pasi. And then he said, the one that we use for the confession. He breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit and the fathers of the church. And we all know this. When I was little, I learned it, that Jesus on that night gave the church priesthood. He made the disciples do the same thing he did when he was around. Remember how he used to say, daughter, your sins are forgiven, go in peace. And everybody was, what is he doing? This is crazy. What would the Jews say, or what would the Pharisees say, when they see Jesus giving the same power to his disciples? What does he want? What's the point? He wants this gift to be in, in the church. In the church. So in the church we get his body. In the church we get his peace. And in the church we get his forgiveness. Okay? Um, <clears throat> now I want to move to the close because I think you, you wonder sometimes why Abun is doing this. What is this? I hope by now you know all what it is. I learned of this and I have to give credit to Amba Bishoy, the late Amba Bishoy. He departed uh, uh, the Metropolitans of El Bereri. He is the first one who came. To, I remember I was in St. George in Maniel and he came with a projector and a slide, one of those old racks of, you know, the rounded ones. And he showed us the images. And I read the book, and then I came to the States, and I kept my interest from the day one. When he, I heard him talk about it, I, in my heart, I said, this is really the shroud of Jesus. And very rarely I'm wrong about my intuition. Very rarely. This piece of cloth has certain things that made me believe from day one. It is actually the, and no matter what happens, what they say, or what they do, I, I'm. So, when I came, I started learning more. I remember when I was in Boston, I, uh, I keep looking into the websites of the Shroud, and I found this website that's one of the famous websites called shroudoftouring.com. And the one who hosts that side and keep it, his name is Barry Schwartz. He's a Jewish photographer, very famous photographer. I think he worked for NASA for a little bit. And he was part of the team, they call it the STIRP team. A group of American scientists decided to go and study the shroud in 1978. 87 or 78, the STIRP team, S-T-U-R-P. Shroud of Turin, Shroud of Turin project, uh, research project. So um, he said, you can get the slides. He took the pictures. He's the one who is an official photographer. He went to Turin in this time and took photographs with a regular camera. I mean, at the time was the highest quality camera of the shroud. And he had this offer. He said, you can take from me a copy of the, of the images I took for uh, 
He said, what? I said, I'll get it. So I sent them the money, check. He sent me, uh, I think, eight slides, had this and this, and had a lot other more slides. And I said, I'm going to do something with it. I bought a scanner at the time, it was 2000. 1999 or 2000. I bought a scanner at the time, it was a $1,000 scanner, and I put the slides in it and turned it into a digital picture of high quality. I had to have a whole, the, the, the DVD was, the burners were very new, and I burned it for like 70, 700 megapixels, or megabytes, I'm sorry, megabytes. 700. That was very high quality then. And I took it and I looked around and I searched and I found a company that actually does the printing. There's a lot of that now. Printing on cloth. They said $3,000 will, will make you a good copy. I said, fine, I'm willing to do that. So they made me this and this. So this image, which is on the shroud that's now in Turin, and then later, 2010, before the revolution in Egypt, I went, they were opening it for exhibition. They, they wanted, the Vatican wanted to have it for exhibition for 10 days. I remember going to Turin. I, I booked a flight, went to Turin, and spent, I don't speak any Italian. It was a very interesting adventure. And I had to go at six o'clock in the morning to see it. I stood in front of the door of the church. It was raining, it was six o'clock in the morning because I have to catch it. A plane at noon. I arrived at, at late night, gonna have to leave at noon, going to Egypt. So I stood there with nuns and monks with light rain. I remember very clearly, like yesterday. And then the door is open, and then we go in, and here is the shroud. I had a, something in my mind. I said, you did all this for the shroud. The, Jesus himself is with you in the, on the altar. Why do you need to do, give yourself that trouble? As if I'm talking to God. Because I went in there, the altar in the Catholic Church, St. Giov Giovanni uh, uh, Cathedral, and then the altar is here, and behind the altar is the shroud, the two of them together, the mass, the liturgy, and the body of Christ, and the shroud. And I stood there for like 45 minutes. In regular visits, you have lines, you go on for five minutes. I stood there for almost an hour, attending a liturgy. And then um, I saw it. It's really, it makes your hair stand again, something very impressive. Very faint, and it's getting fainter, by the way. But we have copies now. Everybody has a copy. On this side of the shroud, on this side of the, I'm sorry, on this shroud, the real one, the regular one that looks like the original, has the image in a negative form. Negative. It's not positive. You look at it. The black is white. White is black. Dark is light. Light is dark. See what I mean? Uh, you look on the other side. It's reversed. And when you reverse it to the negative of the negative, you get what? The positive. You get the face. And it's a very impressive one. Look at him. He's like, so cool. Can you imagine this person went through hell? And he's beaten and crucified, died in agony. Do you see any anger? Do you see any uh, agony in his face? Look at him. It's like he's asleep, about to wake up, right? So, in this one, <clears throat> you have three or four mark, marks. Let me show you the marks. The first mark that you notice and is very prominent is this here, which is burn marks. This was folded in a silver box in a church in, uh, in, uh, in Italy, and then the church burned. So when the silver started to melt, Drops of the silver corners went into the corner of the cloth and, and digged holes in the cloth. Later, they have to give it to the nuns. They cut the pieces, the charred pieces, and replace them with patches. That's what you see here, it's patches. And they kept those charred pieces. They have them. Vatican have it. That's the first mark and the most prominent mark. What's the second mark? Blood stains. See them? They're bright red as if they just freshly coat on a piece of cloth. What's the third mark? The third mark is the anatomically correct, the correct anatomical figure of a man. How tall is he? He's six foot. The, 
the whole thing uh, the whole thing is 14 feet the width of it's three and a half the other marks that you'll find here water marks these are water marks because when they're trying to um, quench the fire that the box had they dumped water and water went through you notice here that's a lot of blood here with an oval shape wound between the fifth and sixth rib where the spear went. You have the right hand on top of the left with blood coming from nails. You have blood coming from the head and the back of the head. Don't look at the rounded area on top of the head. This is water. The other side of the head, the back of the head is a little bit further up. And you have the shoulders and all these marks everywhere, which is the scourge marks. Everywhere, all the way to the calf and the front of the chin and in front of the chest and the torso. The back of the shoulders received the most of it. You can see that it's very bloody. And the thighs, the back of the thighs and the back of the calves. And then on the very top, you're going to see the feet with blood and mud. Here also you see some clear areas, these clear areas. These are not empty spaces. This is what you have remains of serum liquid, water. Looks like water. So they said this is where the spear went with the water and the, the blood. How? Now let's go a little bit. Uh, I'm not, I'm not going to spend too much time about the different things, but um, I'm going to say a few things. How did this image ma was made? How this image was made? They first said, the STIRP team said this. All the people who went said, we, we, we know this is a forgery. An artist in medieval times came with a brush and some paint, and he did it. OK. And then Schwartz himself, if he speaks to you, he, we brought him here, actually. Uh, Barry Schwartz, I brought him here to talk to us, I think two years after I came. And then he said, we, I, I thought, I'm going to go to Italy, we'll go to the Vatican, we get the shroud out, uh, come closer with a magnifying glass, look at the, sh the cloth, see the lines of color with the brush, conclude it is forgery, good night, we go home. And we spend, he said, hundred thousands of hours, not just there. He took samples and they took photographs and they did a lot of things and they went home and every one of them dedicated. This is the most studied Christian artifact, artifact in history. It might be actually the most studied artifact period. I said, so we came with one conclusion. What's the conclusion they came with? It's not a forgery. What is it? We don't know. It's a mystery. What is it? How did this happen? So they studied, one of the things that they studied is chemistry. They said, let's study the chemistry of the shroud. And they said, when you look at the, the fibrils, the small fibers from the darker area, they said, these fibrils suffered dehydrative oxidation or oxidative dehydration. What does that mean? Water was taken out and actually the fiber was oxidized as, as if it's fried. And it's only happening not the whole depth. It's happening at a one-tenth of a hair breadth. This change is happening to a very, very superficial layer. Where do you get that from? The most difficult thing, the most amazing thing they found, actually, is that when you take a picture to this shroud with something called VB8, a machine made to analyze images from space, we used NASA stuff, and it said the image actually is 3D. When you see it, it's almost as, as more, more exciting than this. You see a 3D Jesus. They said this image is not just a flat image. It's actually image with digital information that can be taken and translated into a statue. Yeah. Burial hair and everything. So this, this is a very detailed image. How can a forger a person who wants to make an image get that sophisticated. And then the next question is, how did this image was made? He said, they said one thing, where you have blood, there is no image under it. So imagine the forger wanting to go and do an image, 
So he would actually paint the image or do the image somehow and then put the blood on top of it. But where you have the blood, you shouldn't have image because the blood is on top of the image. But there's no image under the blood. How is that going to happen? So th how is this to happen? They said the physicist came. That's one of the people who studied, that study physics. <coughs> They said if you have an image of someone by draping it on their face, imagine I'm going to get a, sh uh, a linen cloth and drape it on my face, like this, okay? Let's say, uh, yeah, and I just a piece of cloth. So I drape this piece of cloth on my face, and then I bring it up. What happened to the face? How do you see the face? Huh? It's, it's going to be like Fatira. Right? As if you, you got that face and smashed it on a piece of clothes. Because it's going to say, it's going to show you the sides as the same level with this piece. But my face is not like that. So I'm going to do this here. I'm going to have this over my face. So these sides and this side on the side. Okay, imagine that. And I'm going to turn it up and then make it flat. What would it look like? It's flat and big and distorted. So how is this image made? Perfectly. They said this cannot happen unless there is radiation coming from the body itself. This is not a reflection. This is the body itself emitting radiation, but the radiation is not going sideways. They're all going forward, right? So what does that mean? They said there's only one situation that this can happen. It's a radiation in something the physicist called event horizon. What's that? Event horizon is what's happened at the beginning of the universe in the Big Bang. What does that mean? That means that the resurrection of Christ, there is a new creation. The same events that happened in the time of the beginning of the universe happened exactly at the time of the resurrection, where Jesus' body is beginning a new universe. And that explains a lot, because that's why he's asking us to take from his body and drink from his blood, then we actually belong to a new universe. When that universe is going to come after the this universe has to go away, then you find yourself have a relation, you have, you have a place, you belong to this. And this, we understand this theology because we say, when Jesus gave his body and blood to the, to the disciples, I told you this on, on, on uh, Thursday, right? When he gave his body and blood, what does he mean? That we become part of him. When he goes to the cross, who's going to the cross? All of us. When he's resurrected, who's going to be resurrected? All of us. We are part of him. He carries us with him. Whatever he does, we are in him. But we have to first knock down this universe so that we can be actually shown. We can be seen. You get this? Is this too, too difficult to understand? The Shabbat has a lot to say. A lot more. A lot more to say about his suffering. You know, there's a lot to say about the Shroud. There's a whole textbooks, many textbooks, an encyclopedia written about the Shroud. And uh, the last thing I want to say with people ask me, because you go on the internet, this is what I'm saying. Don't believe the culture. The culture that we live in is anti-Christ. It's preparing for the real anti-Christ. It is. In the fashion, in the truth, the lies, everything is lied about. About everything. It's, it's like so sickening. It makes me sick every time I read about how they deal and explain things. This shroud, when the stirb went there, they said, okay, you want to really get to the bottom of this, you're going to have to do carbon dating. What's carbon dating? It's a test they do to measure the amount of radioactive carbon, carbon-13-14, to know how much, because there's a theory done by a German physicist, they said, uh, you get half-life of the carbon, it's long, you know how much carbon radioactive to not, because radioactive carbon goes to become lead. If you know the ratio between the radioactive carbon and the lead, you can tell how long this piece was dead. So it, the linen was a plant, was alive, taking carbon from the air. It has a carbon, radioactive carbon. As time goes by, after it dies, the carbon turns into lead. So if you know the ra ratio between the carbon 
the radioactive carbon in the lady can tell how old is it. They said, if you want to do this on the test and find how much carbon and lead in this piece, please follow a certain protocol. Because this will have a problem if you date it otherwise. So you have to take different areas. You cannot take a single area. You're going to have to take different areas. You're going to have to do it in multiple places. And you don't take from the sides. Why they said the sides has been handled too much by people. Every time they open. They open it, the sides gets held, so you're going to have a problem with this. So they went and did the carbon dating after the STIRP team. And they got, you can see the picture on the internet, very proud man says, it is 1300. The date of the shroud is 1300. And then they send it to another one, it became 1200. Send it to another one, it become the 1100. It means medieval times. And everybody said, wow. And then, one of the friends of Barry Schwartz, he's a chemist. He was very much interested in the shroud and said, no, that's it, done it for me. The shroud is hoax, I'm not going to touch it again. Close this and, and don't listen to the crazy refraff, he called them. And then um, a husband and wife in, in, in Ohio said, what if the sample they took, and they took the sample from somewhere on the, like the very end here or here. What if the sample they took is not completely the shroud material? They came up with this idea. I said, at one time, the shroud belonged to the French royal family. Very aristocrat, very rich people had access, listen to this, to what we call, um, what do you call it? The fine restoration. So we in Muslim, for Muslim, it's a mere raffa. Amal raffa. How you do this restoration? This, the nuns in France, they used to do it. They get threads. They don't get patches. And they splice the thread through as if it actually is part of the original. But they have to, and he said, if this theory is true, they have to use cotton. Because linen gets yellowish with time. You cannot have linen stay the same way white like this. It gets yellowish. But to get a new linen and put it on, it will be clearly seen. And unfortunately, linen doesn't accept dye. You cannot dye linen. So they're going to have to use thinking through, right? Use cotton. Cotton accept dyes. If you find cotton in this shroud, then the, the sample was wrong. And then he said, the man was dying. Roy Rogers, that chemist, was dying. He said, I'm done with this. And so uh, uh, Barry Schwartz told him, and in a, in a, on a YouTube video, you can see it on the internet, he said, please do this. You don't have time. He had cancer and he's dying. He said, I'm just going to do it for you, but I, I, I believe this is the, the subject is closed. So he went under the microscope, and he had some pieces. He did have the pieces that they left over from the carbon dating. Look, looked at it, and he said, you wouldn't believe it. It's cut, there's cotton fibers and a dye, a gum. And he published a paper in what we call it, I, I forgot what's the name of the magazine. Uh, uh, Therma Chemica, I think that's the magazine. And he published a paper before he died. He published it, and a month later, he, he's gone. And he said in this paper, the shroud samples that was given to the carbon dating is contaminated. It's two types. It's linen and cotton. And everybody understood this, and they studied it later in Italy, and they said it, it is absolutely it. Because it's actually splice it. You cannot see it. You cannot see it. You splice it like this. So this part, let's say this part is linen, this part is cotton. When they took the sample, they cut it exactly here, and they divided it, three pieces. And they said the piece was only cotton, was 1300, and very little linen in it. The piece that was mixed was 12, and the piece that was closer to the linen was 11, but still have the dye and still have the cotton. As if they took the piece and cut it, from the newer to the older. So the more new material you have, it leaned toward 1300. The less newer material they have, it leaned toward, and they, they publish stuff in, in Italy today, and actually it's very impressive. So this carbon dating is nonsense. But they said, now they, they are actually, everybody's angry, they said they did it on purpose. Why you do that on purpose? They were dying for the shroud to be Fake. They wanted the fresh shot to be fake. Like everything is done today. There's a lot of things done on purpose, but you know. 
Okay, tell us, yeah, how, tell us how the person can fake this in the medieval times. They didn't have any idea about negative to start with. That negative idea was not known until photography. The first one who took <coughs> a picture of Charles II Bea, it was nine, 1900, 1895. In the 1895, who would know anything about negative? It was the first negative he took, and then he saw the image of the face of Jesus. And he made it, it was shocking to him. Imagine the person going to his lab, you know, in the old times. You do the negative, and they go to your lab and do what? Develop the negative. So he put the slide, it was a bag, it's a big glass slide like this, of the face. He put it in his sink, <coughs> put the chemicals with the red light, and he was waiting for it to develop. And all of a sudden he looked at it, and he was shocked. There was a face looking at him. Because what he took picture of is that. And you cannot see a face in this. But you look at this, that's what you see. So that is what the shroud, and that's why I keep it here for 50 days, because that's what the disciples had. I keep it hanging for our 50 days. Look at it every time you come. When you come to the time of Holy Week, I like to sit on this side, looking at it. Because it has everything the Holy Week talks about, especially Friday and Sunday. Here is one more thing, and I'm going to conclude with this. The shroud doesn't have just the image of Jesus. And, and, and you have to understand, it has actually bones and flesh. If you look up to the mouth, there are teeth with roots. Can you see them? Can you see the jaw with the teeth and the roots? You see that? If you focus a little careful under the mustache, Yes, and then here you can see actually the bones of the fingers. It is an image of Jesus inside and out. Because the rays were not coming just from his skin. It was coming from every single cell in his body. Every single micro millimeter of his body was emitting this energy, sending it out. So that's, that's very, very impressive to me. Um, that's the shroud. It's going to continue to take my attention the rest of my life, I guess, like everybody else who knows that about the shroud. I don't, I don't let it down. Every time I go and read a little bit about what they're doing with it and the studies they're doing with it. Mm -hmm. Up until now, that can produce the same picture, the same image. Up until now, there is no technology known to man that can produce that same image, Ibuna. There is no way, yes. Okay. And to, to do it this way, not this way. This way we can think about. But I'm, I'm just saying, the, the, the person who did it, if there's a person, have to think about this and draw this. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, to the Holy Spirit. Amen.